Well, thank you very much. Thanks for coming out today. Um, can't believe this weather, so enjoy it while we have it, I guess. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Gary Lenhoff is a Chief Investment Officer at Great Lakes Advisors, which is a division of Wintrust Wealth Management. He is a member of the Investment Committee, as well as the Portfolio Manager responsible for Great Lakes Small Cap Equity Strategy. Gary brings more than 25 years of industry experience managing both large and small cap portfolios. Uh, he began his career as an analyst with Prudential Investment Company, where he eventually managed a $3.3 billion portfolio of leveraged buyout and equity investments. He then served as a portfolio manager for Anderson, Hoagland and Company in St. Louis from 1993 to 2000, managing an $800 million portfolio. Subsequently, Gary helped build a team of seven analysts at Bricolor Capital Management, where he assisted in growing a small cap long short equity portfolio from 450 million to over 1.3 billion dollars in assets most recently he was chief investment officer at ironworks capital management responsible for all aspects of security selection portfolio construction and risk management gary became a chartered financial analyst in 1993 and is a member of the cfa society of chicago he received a ba in economics from the uh, University of Rochester and an MBA for th from the University of Michigan. Gary Lip resides in Northbrook with his wife and three children. Gary? Thank you, Deb. I suddenly feel very old. Thanks, Deb. Thank you, and uh, thanks to the, uh, the Lake Forest, Lake Bluff Chamber of Commerce for, uh, for having me and my colleagues at Lake Forest Bank. Steve Melota, Dave Ruskin, um, the others, thanks for, uh, for the invitation. I enjoy getting out and talking about this stuff uh, from time to time, and um, hopefully uh, you'll, uh, you'll stay awake and I'll be able to answer a few questions. Uh, uh, come back, ask me at the end if I don't explain what the heck it means by balancing budgets or balancing rocks. Um, I'll come back and explain it, but hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll convey that to you in my presentation. So um, just some of the things we're gonna touch upon. A quick review of the U.S. economy, um, jobs and small business in the United States. I, I assume being a local chamber of commerce, there are a number of, how many people here, just raise your hand if you, you own or work for a small business in the local community. Good, okay. Um, small, we'll talk about small businesses and their role in the U.S. economy. Um, we'll talk about U.S. monetary policy. We'll talk some uh, specifically about China. Uh, you've heard about China, I assume, recently, the last three, five, seven, ten years. Um, and then uh, I'll try and answer the question my um, daughter asked me when she was uh, t 13 years old, which was um, basically, Dad, why don't we just print more money? Um, which uh, I think I used to know the answer to that question, but I'm not so sure I do anymore. <coughs> um, real quickly around the world, we'll touch on some of this. I said we'll talk about China. Um, there's a lot of things we won't touch on because obviously I don't have enough time to, and you don't want to listen to me talk that long about everything that's going on in the world. Um, we're not going to really talk much about the Middle East, but I would pose a somewhat rhetorical question to you that um, somebody asked me if you read in the paper that Russian bombers were, uh, Russian fighter planes were dropping bombs in Syria, would you think that the price of oil would be $35 a barrel? Um, we're not going to talk about that, that part of the world. We're not really going to talk much about Europe. You know that, uh, you may know that um, Europe has been a mess for some time. The, the United States has become very adept at creating uh, fiscal and monetary crises and then exporting it to the rest of the world. Um, Europe has a bad case of that uh, after 2008, 2009. Um, uh, the, the British are going to vote in June whether they should leave the European Union. They, they never joined the uh, monetary union, but they are a member of the European Union, and um, they're going to vote next month whether they, uh, they want to stay in the union or not, and that would have some implications, I think, for, uh, for the global economy. Um, and then uh, Dave said you're not going to get out of here without talking about U.S. presidential politics. Um, I'm going to try, but uh, obviously the political election later this year will likely have some kind of impact on the U.S. economy, U.S. markets, et cetera. So I'm going to start with the U.S. economy, uh, and there's going to be a lot of numbers in the next few slides that I'm going to go through pretty quickly, and knowing, remembering the numbers or knowing them really isn't important. What's important is um, the impact, the, the lesson, I think, that we can take out of knowing 
what what's comprises the economy and what's important and what's not. Uh, the U.S. economy, you may know, is about $18 trillion at the end of last year. 70% um, of that is personal consumption. Folks in this room buying tickets to uh, come to a Chamber of Commerce lunch. Um, one third of that is goods, two thirds of it is services. So we are a uh, consumer driven, service based economy. About 20% is government spending. 40% um, of that is the federal government. Um, the vast majority, or 60% of the, what the federal government spends, is defense related. Uh, not many people realize it, but actually more than half is state and local spending, uh, local uh, governments such as uh, Lake Forest. Um, the remainder, or 16%, is, is fixed investment, which is uh, primarily businesses investing in machinery, equipment, buildings, et cetera. The balance is uh, the housing, new housing stock, residential housing. Um, and if you're good with numbers or you're checking me out, you'll say, wait a minute, um, that adds up to more than 100%. The U.S. is a uh, net importer. We import about $525 billion more in goods and services than we export. And so that's actually a negative impact on our economy. Um, exports are, are good. Imports are less good. They compete with local uh, businesses. Um, and we're, we, we run what would, could be described as, is described as a chronic trade account deficit. Again, not terribly, not new news, not surprising news for a developed economy, the largest economy in the, in the world. Um, this is where there's a lot of numbers, and I'm going to just skip over a lot of it. But you know, we've grown from a uh, personal income of $60 billion in 1935 has grown to $15.4 trillion last year. Um, compensation, employment, what you get paid for working is 63% of that. Um, another 9% is people who own their own business and might not get paid a salary, but take an income from that business. And you can see, not surprisingly, that number has dropped from 17% in the 30s when there were many fewer large companies and many more family-owned farms and businesses to about 9% today. Interest in dividends on securities has been reasonably flat recently at about 14%. The number that um, my pointer doesn't work on this high tech screen, but uh, if you look at the government transfer payments, um, has grown substantially. In the 30s, there were no government transfer payments. There were some veteran benefits paid to veterans of World War I. Today, 17% of personal income is made up by transfer payments from, uh, from the government to individuals. Um, taxes take about 13% of that. Our contribution to government social programs takes another 8%. And at the bottom, one of the numbers that is probably most important on here, growth, the growth in that top number per capita real inflation adjusted disposable income um, has only been growing at about 1% uh, in, for the last five years, which uh, obviously we've all read and heard a lot about. More numbers here, just I'm going to focus on the right side. It becomes pretty obvious. Personal income growth has slowed from s almost 7% in the 20 years, 1980 to 2000, to about 4% in the last 15 years. Um, that's not quite as bad as it appears because inflation has also been lower in the last several, really the last four or five years, but it's still um, you know, a, a number to, uh, to, to take note of. Compensation is growing at about 3.4%. Of that, wages, which are the largest part, wages used to be about 85% of that. It's now 81% of um, compensation only growing at 2%. And that's, I mean, everyone in this room probably knows that, that the economy is producing jobs now. We're growing, we're adding 150, 200,000 jobs, uh, net new jobs a month, but wages aren't growing. In fact, um, the most recent number in February, wages dropped slightly. Um, that's a big deal, we'll come back to why. Employer supplements have grown. Wages used to be, as I said, 85%. They're now 81. That's because employer supplements paying your, uh, your share uh, when you own your own business of unemployment, of Social Security, um, now comprises 19% and has grown at 3% or, or almost 4%. Taxes have not grown as fast as people feel like they have um, or think that they have. Taxes have grown at about 3% the last 15 years. Um, and... Uh, Personal contributions to government social programs have also grown at 3.5%. The, the number that is most interesting on this slide is on the bottom right. Government transfer payments continue to grow at about the same rate that they did in the 20 years from 1980 to 2000. 
If you look down that right-hand column, nothing else is growing anywhere close to that, and so that presents an obvious challenge or question. So some very simple observations. Um, growth in personal income has slowed, primarily as a result of slower wage growth in the last 10 years, and certainly in the last six years, seven years since the 2008-2009 recession. Taxes have grown faster than incomes over time. That has not been the case since 2000, as I said. Instead, government transfer payments, the ones we all know, have grown to be an ever larger portion of personal income, a trend that is not likely sustainable. Um, I sat in a, I am old, I sat in a speech that Pete Peterson made in New York in 1980, and he said, Social Security is not viable for the next, I don't know if he said 30 years, 50 years, but this is not a new problem. We have known about this for a long, long time, and we have not done nearly enough about it. Um, if you think about it, one of the simplest things to forecast is demographics. We know about how many births there are, about how many deaths. We all know that the U.S. population is aging. Uh, we all know how much health care is consumed at various points in people's lives, what it costs to retire, and we simply haven't set enough, set aside enough money to support the programs that we've put in place, which seem to be uh, forever growing. Inflation-adjusted disposable income is currently stagnant. Um, disposable incomes aren't growing, and that's... Uh, primarily a function of the lack of wage growth. Uh, we live in a country and in a world today where there is no inflation um, statistically measured. If you have children in college, if you consume health care, if you need child care, you probably don't agree with that statement. Um, there is inflation in pockets. It seems to affect people more than the government stati uh, uh, official statistics suggest. And the bottom line is disposable income isn't growing at the current rate, at the current day. Uh, this is an incredibly obvious <laughs> statement to make, but it's cr absolutely critical in my view. New job creation and more importantly, real wage growth are absolutely critical to the U.S. economy. Um, so I'm going to talk a little, if, if you accept that wage growth and job growth are critical, I'm going to spend a little bit more time on things like employment and wages. And this is a little, it's an interesting slide, it's a little troubling. Uh, this shows um, all of the recessions since World War II and what percentage of jobs were lost in the economy from the peak and how long it took us to get back there. And the, the frightening thing is, the colors are hard to see, but, um, and I can't point, but the, as you go from right to left, those are all the most recent recessions in order. So the summary, the conclusion you might draw is each time we have a recession, um, it takes longer to get back to where we were in terms of employment. And so the red line, which when I printed this chart, um, we hadn't reached yet, there's a, a um, vertical red line right under March 2014. That's when we finally got back from the, to, to where we were uh, in terms of jobs in the United States in 2000, in the, in the peak prior to the 08, 09 downturn. And that represents um, six and a half years. It took six and a half years for us to recover the jobs that we lost. The, the number of jobs we lost was equal to more than 6% of the total jobs in the United States. And then you can see, if you go to the left, the brown line is 2001. It took us four years, but we only lost 2% of our jobs. And then the black line is 1990, where we only, again, lost one and a half percent of the jobs and we got them back in two and a half years. So it's taking longer. The last recession was a doozy. They called it the Great Repression. Some did. Um, we lost six percent of our jobs. It took us six and a half years to get back to where we were. Um, this, in this room, I don't know how many of you know this, feel this, but this comes from the, uh, the Small Business Administration um, and from ADP. Uh, Small businesses in the United States create 70 to 80 percent of the new jobs in this country. Is, is there anyone that's surprised by that or thought, you know, it's IBM, and IBM's probably a bad example, but it's not the large companies. Now, what I don't have up here is small businesses also destroy the most jobs in this country, and when I say destroy, I mean in tough times they go out of business or they have to reduce their staffing. Um, but net, 
when the economy is doing well, it's small businesses that drive job growth in the United States. This is a, from the National Federation of Independent Business. I don't know, is anybody here a member of uh, NFIB? About 325,000 small businesses across the country are members. Uh, I I'd encourage you, if you're looking for one source of data to kind of explain to you what on God's earth is going on sometimes in the economy, especially if you run a small business, National Federation of Independent Businesses is, has a great website, lots of information. They do a survey every month of over 6,000 small businesses and ask a series of questions and then publish the results. So this is um, going back to the mid-70s, an overview of their overall optimism index. It's a diffusion index. It's simply how many say things are good ver minus how many are bad. Um, so uh, anything, um, you can see the, the index here took a steep drop in the 1980-81 recession. If you remember that, the prime rate of interest was 21%, long-term Treasuries yielded 14, mortgages were 17 percent, and uh, um, small businesses optimism obviously plunged. It flattened out for a number of years. Prior, what's interesting is it started to drop actually in 06, 07, prior to the 08, 09 downturn, um, and has recovered since then. We have not gotten back anywhere near to where we were. And if you look at the very end, the last couple, last 18 months really, actually small business owners have been less optimistic than they had been in 2012-13, let's say. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about why in a minute. We got all excited in January because uh, in January, wage growth, which has been growing at about 1.5% a year for, a, for a quite some time, picked up a little bit. I think the average, uh, the month, the 12, rolling 12-month 12 average uh, or the January annualized number, I forget which, was about 2.4%, which we, historically, we've seen 3, 3.5% three wage growth, and I think most economists, of which I am not one, um, would tell you that we need 3, 3.5% three wage growth to really grow the economy at 3%. Well, duh, if it's 70% consumer, and uh, most of that is personal income and wages, then yeah, we need three, three and a half percent wage growth to drive the economy by three and three and a half percent. In January, it ticked up, and from the small business survey that the NFIB does, um, they said as up top, a seasonally adjusted 27% of owners reported raising compensation, the strongest reading since 2007. That's very encouraging. Um, however, the gap between frequency of con how many times you raised your workers' compensation and how many times you were able to raise your prices is growing large. Translated, no one can raise prices. Um, it's very difficult. I'm sure, again, many people in this room, uh, I know we see it in our business. There's a lot of pressure on, on pricing. There is no inflation. There is very little inflation in raw most raw material costs. You can't pass through costs that aren't increasing. And in fact, a number of uh, customers are asking for uh, reductions in price. And so it's difficult to raise wages when you're not able to generate revenue growth through price increases. You have to do it the old-fashioned way, which is growing the business through volume increases. The other uh, optimistic view coming or, or good news coming out of the January survey was that 29% of small businesses had jobs that they weren't able to fill, um, the highest level since the recession. That's kind of an interesting observation. It didn't say 29% of the jobs that they that are open that they want to fill they said that they're not able to fill them and you have to go a little bit deeper and say what what exactly does that mean which brings me to um carmine mentioned, mentioned this before this is my favorite part of the survey a lot of months um what's this they ask everybody over six thousand responses what is the single most important problem facing your business today so anyone who runs a small business if you want to just shout what is it? What's the, what's the single most important problem facing your business today? A lot of people would say, I'm not selling enough. Um, that's not it. What's, what, anyone have a guess? I'm going to show you what it's not. It's not inflation. It's not the cost of borrowing. It's not the cost of labor, which is kind of interesting. It's not competition from the big guy down the street who might crush me. Poor sales is a distant fourth, which is kind of surprising. Quality of labor, 
is third. And that's when we go back to what that earlier observation about not able to fill jobs. A lot of small companies are finding they can't find qualified people to fill the jobs that they do have. This is for Carmine and others. Government regulation and red tape. It's a lot of them. We hear it, you know, you run small businesses. We invest in small companies, but they're public companies, so they tend to have revenues of hundreds of millions of dollars, and the companies might be worth two, three, four billion dollars. They say the same thing. Basically, they say, tell me what the rules are. I need to be able to plan for a year or two or three. I can't run my business month to month. I mean, I can if I have to, but I'm not going to hire people. People are very expensive to hire and fire. I'm not going to bring people on. I'm not going to make a capital investment in a piece of equipment if you're going to change the rules six months from now, 12 months from now, if I don't know what the, the rules of the road are. We hear that over and over and over. We have huge infrastructure in this country. Um, until about 10 years ago, we used to have a transportation bill that would fund investment in infrastructure, bridges, roads, tunnels, railroads, and it would be a five-year bill. It would be $150, $200 billion. And so states, towns, municipalities could plan. We can build a road. We can build a tunnel. We can, you know, develop a piece of property that we'll be able to get to. For 10 years, because of gridlock in Washington, we had quarterly transportation bills. No one's going to commit hundreds of millions of dollars to a new infrastructure project if they think the government funding for half of it might disappear in three months or six months. So think about what that did to the construction unions and their employment. Think what that did to companies making steel, cement. Um, I hit the button too soon. Taxes is always number one. Um, taxes are too high. So where are we today? Um, the good news is, as I said before, we're adding 150, 200,000 jobs a month. The, we've, we've replaced all the jobs we lost. You see that horrific dip? That was the, there were two or three months where we lost 800,000 jobs, net jobs in this country in 2000, late 2008, early 2009. Very scary time. We've gotten them all back and then some. We're adding jobs. Employers are hiring. Hourly earnings, you can see where they were up until 2010, up in that 3 and 3.5% three and range. You can see where they've been below, pretty much consistently below 2 until recently, which is very encouraging. Um, I'm not ready. We're not ready to call it a trend yet because, as I said, this was through January. The February numbers came out last week. They were not good. Um, it's a month. They're seasonally adjusted. Uh, there's a lot of noise in the data. Everyone suggests, and we try and suggest to people as well, don't look at one month. Let's look at a rolling 12 months or um, a longer period of time. Uh, no one listens to us, including us. We still look at the months and say that wasn't good. Um, but we clearly need, uh, we need wage growth, and we need wage growth in this country to drive a consumer-driven economy. We're starting to see some signs that things are a little bit better, but it's way too early to... to, to be terribly comfortable that that's going to continue. Let's switch, policy, let's switch policies. Let's switch topics and talk a little bit about monetary policy, um, and in particular, talk about what the Federal Reserve has done to, uh, depending on your viewpoint, either save the world from a uh, certain economic disaster, flood the world with U.S. dollars. Um, going back to my daughter's question, why don't we just print more money uh, when we have problems? Um, I have to put this up there because I say printing money. I firmly believe the Federal Reserve is printing money. They will violently disagree with that and say we're not printing money. This comes from the, uh, the Bank of England, actually. Um, the way they inject money, they tell us, is not, does not involve printing banknotes. They instead buy assets from private institutions, banks, and they credit the seller's bank account. Okay. This does not involve printing more banknotes. Instead, they pay for these assets by creating money electronically and crediting the account. So they're not printing banknotes, money. They're creating electrons. They're doing it by computer. Um, I didn't, it's a distinction without a difference to me. They're creating, they're not creating wealth. They're creating a form of payment. And now they don't print money. They don't use paper and ink and printing machines, they use computers. 
which is a little frightening because they can do it a whole lot faster. So this is what happens when you don't print money. Um, in 2008, 2009, the world did in fact, the financial world at least, looked over the edge. Um, we've all tried to forget how painful that was uh, for investors, for consumers, for people who had a job, people who ran a business. And the Fed embarked on what was called quantitative easing. They did three um, courses of this. And I'm not going to go through what they did there, other than to tell you that the Fed's balance sheet, was, which was about $900 billion in June of 2008, um, is now $4.5 trillion. And that's uh, the, the effect of going out and buying primarily mortgages and treasuries from in the marketplace uh, with electrons that they have created uh, to put inject capital into the system, into the global economy. And why is all of this important? I mean, why would they, why did they do that? Well, they're trying to spur activity. They're trying to instill confidence. And the question is, where does that money that's been created, not printed, go? Where did it go? What was it used for? Why do you think that's going to work, right? I mean, I've always been told, you can't just print money. You can't, you know, Ben Bernanke, in 2002, I believe, or three, he was a new Fed governor. And he literally said, I think Milton Friedman said it originally, but he said, um, if the economy was sufficiently weak, we will drop dollar, we will drop money from helicopters. He got the name Helicopter Ben from that. We will fly helicopters over cities and drop money, which will spur the economy because you will find your $10 on the if you're a good American, you'll find $10 on the street and you'll go out and spend 12. But you'll spend it. It'll get back into the economy. It will reinvigorate ac economic growth. Well, has that happened? Um, I, again, I can't help it. Throwing money off the top of a building and then hoping that it works. So what happened? Well, look at this is uh, Caterpillar here in Illinois makes a, uh, a heavy construction equipment dependent upon capital expenditures. They make a they put out a forecast uh, and a review of capital expenditures around the world. These are in trillions of dollars. So what happened from 08 to 2012 is we went out and spent um, trillions and trillions of dollars on new construction, new equipment. This is capital investment. This isn't consumers. So by one measure, it worked. Economic activity around the world picked up rather robustly. Why? Look, this, this shows just two anecdotal observations. Um, China went on a spending spree. And that was a good thing for a long time. So China, on the left side, crude steel production, you can see the world crude, world steel production uh, capacity is flat as a board from 2000 through today. But world capacity is up quite nicely, and it's all China. On the other side, global cement, pretty much the same thing. China building massive capacity to build China, to build its infrastructure, to support its economy. Um, and what happened around the rest of the world is increasingly the rest of the world, including the US, but certainly in Latin America, Europe, and other parts of Asia, they built capacity to supply China and their growing need for um, steel production capability, cement, at agriculture, et cetera. This is the last 10 years. China has consumed, metallurgical coal is the coal that goes into making steel. 75% of all met coal in the world has been consumed by China. 60% of the thermal coal, that's what we burn when we burn coal to heat our homes, that's the coal that we use. Aluminum, nickel, zinc, copper, iron ore, lead, 40, 50% of the global consumption of all those commodities has been consumed by China. Only 10, 20% of oil and natural gas, interestingly enough. But still, for, a, for the second largest economy with 20% of the world's population, they're consuming 20% of the oil consumed globally. These are the other things that happen when you print money or when you create a means of payment and, and put it out into the real economy. 25% or $7 trillion of global debt 
has an interest rate below zero today. So if you go to Switzerland, where they're not on the euro, and you want to buy a 10-year bond, you have to pay to put your money into that bond. You're shaking your head, like, why on God's earth would I do that? Germany, out to seven years, I believe. Japan, Japan out to four or five years. Overnight rates, a CD in Japan. You pay your bank 30 basis points. Why would you do that? Well, because you might hold your wealth in euros or the Brazilian real or the Chinese yuan, and you're concerned that it's going to lose value. And is the Swiss franc is not going to lose value. Why not? Well, because it just never does. <laughs> They're, the Swiss are fiscally responsible. They're not in the euro. And basically, you're preserving your wealth. You're not talking about growing it or keeping up with inflation or anything. You're trying to protect your wealth from deteriorating. Um, and what's happened is, as the U.S. dollar has strengthened, because our interest rates are still 1% or 2%, and we have the, now the strongest economy in the world, and the other economies have weakened, including China, those countries have had to devalue their currencies or allow their currencies to weaken. Why would you do that? Because now your exports are more competitive. You can price your products. Your products priced in U.S. dollars are cheaper for Americans to buy than they were before you devalued. A classic example, Harley-Davidson. If anybody owns a, a Harley, Har Harley has about 50% of the global market for large motorcycles, and they've got a very well-known and established brand, and they're well-known their well-understood policy is we're not going to pr cut price to grow market share because we have, a we, we have a very valuable franchise, we have a good product, and we deserve to be paid what it's worth. Well, they lose market share in times like this because Yamaha and Honda, which manufacture in Japan, can export their motorcycles, their large motorcycles, to the U.S., their motorcycles are 12 or 15% cheaper than Harleys to start with. They become another 10 or 12% cheaper when the Japanese yen weakens because now you're using a strong dollar to buy a, a, a motorcycle that was manufactured in Japanese costs. And they lop on top of that another 10% price cut just to try and take market share. And that works for a year or two. And then things typically have reverted back and Harley will gain back much of that share. But What's happened in this round is all, many countries, many emerging markets have devalued their currencies so that their products are more competitive. It's been to the detriment for the most part of Europe, of the United States, where our products are exports. And remember, we're a net importer to the tune of 525 billion already, but our exports are now more expensive. Oil prices are $35 in US dollars here, and that's great for us. But oil prices haven't dropped if you have the misfortune of having to spend Russian rubles to buy oil because the Russian ruble has collapsed. And oil is probably only 15% cheaper than it was when it was 110 here in the United States in Russia today because, they're, they're, because oil is priced in dollars and their currency has collapsed. So now what happens when China's economy slows? And this is from the Wall Street Journal just a few weeks ago. 2015 growth in China was the slowest it's been in 25 years. GDP grew at 6.9%, which is a pretty good number. Not many people actually believe that number. They think it's artificially inflated by the, the Chinese government. Um, a lot of it is in the financial services sector. If you look at the real economy, those guys making steel and cement and whatnot, it's even slower. Um, they have way too much housing, way too much factory capacity that they've built coming out of the 0809 downturn. Um, infrastructure spending credit isn't working as well as it used to. Um, industrial output, as I said, is even lower than the 6.9%. Than the that 5.9% number is probably itself a bit high. Um, the amount of debt, especially at the state-owned enterprises in China to support those companies, to provide jobs to Chinese people who are, they want to become consumers, is, is growing at a, at a rather large rate and is of some concern, and we have very little insight or transparency into how bad that problem may be. Now this again is a, this is a long slide. This goes back to 1800, and it shows you that commodity prices um, are in secular decline almost always. 
And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense, right? We start as uh, family farms, and then we have more children, so we're more productive, and we can farm more per acre. And then we bring some technology to bear to it and fertilizer, and we're, we're more productive and more efficient at producing the commodity. And you apply that to any commodity, steel, energy, metals, and that's true. Over the long expanse of time, commodity prices have declined. You can pick out, if you have good eyes, because this is small, where wor World War I and World War II were, because we consume massive amounts of me primarily metals, but con commodities in, in world wars, and the, so the prices will spike, and then they come right back down. And look what happened from two, around 2000, where commodity prices plunged. And that was when productivity was growing at 4 or 5%, and we were just building, we were bringing computer power to bear on how to mine coal or metals or how to produce corn. We were, we were introducing the somewhat controversial notion of genetically modified food and what that was doing to commodity prices. And then what happened from around 2003 till 2008 or 9? China. I told you they consumed... 50 to 70 percent. That's China right there, that upleg. And what we're in now is China's not deteriorating. It's not shrinking. It's just not growing as fast as it had. And the whole world came out of 2008, 2009, spending money to prepare to supply China with what it needed to grow. And it stopped growing as fast. And that's kind of where we find ourselves today. Unfortunately, China, in an effort to um, stimulate the financial services economy, in uh, early 2015 made it easier for ordinary citizens to open a brokerage account and buy shares in, on the Shanghai Exchange in their, what's called their A market. And you can see from almost zero, about 4.5 million new funds with about 3 trillion Canadian yuan were opened by, con by retail investors to buy stocks that's here. So what did the market do? It went crazy. And then the marginal individual consumer didn't open a new account, and the market started to go down, and they panicked. And that's about, I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but that's like a 100% increase in the market and then an 80% decline. And unfortunately, a lot of those people that opened those accounts didn't get in at the front end. They got in at the back end. So now what we look at in the dark blue and gray, that's about 60% of global capital expenditures are under pressure because they are related in some way to commodities. Commodity prices are down. The headlines are all about oil going from 110 to 35, but agricultural fertilizers, metals, copper, copper's described as the metal with a PhD. Well, copper's gone from $6 to $2 a, a pound. They've been decimated, and you read... You read stories about very large, integrated global commodity companies uh, struggling with their debt loads, out, mostly outside the U.S. But this is, um, it is a, it's not a crisis, but it's a very, very difficult time for anyone involved in any of these businesses, including, you know, whether it's um, CAT making heavy equipment for mining. But think about this. Accenture here in Chicago. Accenture is a consulting company, one of the world's largest, right? Primarily involved in uh, information technology and consulting. But about 10% of their revenue comes from the energy sector because their customers that consume that product are energy companies. So they're affected by it because if they don't have the, the money to spend, they're not going to spend it. The estimates are that the decline in global energy prices from 110 in 2014 to 37 today, 28, two weeks ago, has taken out 25 to 30 billion dollars in spending by energy companies last year and another 25 to 30 billion this year. Now that sounds pretty draconian especially if you're in the energy industry. But what are you guys paying for gas? Now it's over $2, 209, 210, probably 215 up here, um $1.29 in Houston, 250 billion dollars in savings for the US consumer because it costs less to if you heat your home to put gas in your car, it's a huge windfall for the U.S. consumer. Uh, unless you work for an energy company, then it might be a little problematic. But it's, been a, it's, a, it's undoubtedly a good thing for the U.S. economy because we're the world's largest consumer of fuels. What the, what's different about that 
this time is the consumer um, isn't spending it. The consumer has saved it. And the savings rate ticked up in the U.S., which is not a bad thing. Asian economies, they, the savings rates run 20, 25 uh, percent. The U.S. the U.S. savings rate in the early 2000s was negative. That's my illusion before to finding ten dollars and spending eleven. Well, now it's about five or six percent, up from three. Why are they not spending it as good Americans typically do? Right? I mean, interest rates are two, three, four percent. Credit card rates are still ridiculously high, but lower. Um, mortgage rates are three and a half percent, all-time lows. Why aren't they spending it? Go back to the beginning about jobs and wages. They're concerned. Am I going to have a job next week, next year? Am I going to get an in, a salary increase? Am I going to get a, an increase in my hourly wages? That's where we are right now. This is a troubling slide because what China, China ran trade surpluses, right? If you think about it, if we run chronic trade deficits, someone has to be on the other side of that. Globally, it has to foot to zero. China, Japan, a lot of emerging markets. Um, they ran surpluses to the tune of uh, collecting about $3 trillion of reserves, which is nice. It's kind of like saying, hey, I lost my job or my, my salary's been cut, but I have $3 trillion in the bank, so I can, I can make it a little while. And so that's what's happened. They've been buying, buying up assets. They've been doing what the Fed showed them how to do, create money, by taking those reserves, buying assets, as the stock market collapsed, buying stocks. They made it illegal to short stocks in China. There are, you'll laugh, some of us who have been in that business don't laugh quite as hard, but there are a number of short sellers in China that can't be located um, because the government has tucked them away somewhere. Hopefully they're still alive. But this graph shows you that um, the Chinese, uh, Chinese reserves are shrinking. And that's about a trillion dollars in aggregate that they've spent. So it's kind of like you said, my hourly wage went down. Don't worry, I've got $3 trillion in the bank. Well, it's now um, two years later, I've only got $2 trillion in the bank. I can still sleep at night, but if this doesn't stop, how much more am I going to spend this year? And so the People's um, Congress is meeting last week and this week, talking about that presumably, and um, trying to instill some confidence in the Chinese economy and the global economy. But... That's the current state of affairs. So just a few thoughts. Consumer spending is critical to US economic growth. And confidence in job security and wage growth is, is paramount. Growth in government transfer payments has to be tamed. Um, it's a problem because it's grown so acute. But the first bullet point is more important than the second one in um, most places with, unfortunately, maybe the state of Illinois and a few other states, a possible exception where it's, it's a little bit worse. Small businesses are absolutely critical to the health of the economy, and we have to have small businesses creating jobs and increasing wages for the economy to be healthy in the United States. And the way you do that is governments have to get fiscal and monetary policy right. You can't just print money, you have to restore discipline, you have to have sensible fiscal policies, f sensible reforms so that small businesses have the confidence that they can forecast for a year or two, take a chance, take a risk, create a job, create a business, a new product. That's what gets the economy growing. God, I sound like I'm running for office. And then there are Interestingly, a number of folks who say, you know, China's not that, China's not that big a deal. Um, and I just can't disagree more. It's, if China disappeared today, would the world survive? Probably. It would be profoundly different for a long time. If China just muddles along, no one's, I don't think the U.S. economy is not going to disappear. It's not going to be down 15, 20 percent next year, but it's going to be a long slog. We're talking about generations. Um, and the Chinese and Asian cultures, many cultures outside North America, they think in terms of generations, not quarters, not weeks. What's the stock market doing today? Who cares? Really? I mean, they're thinking we want our children 
to have a better life than ours. That sounds familiar to a lot of us because that was this country 50, 60, 70 years ago. They want our way of living. Why do they work so hard? Because they want to give their children a place so that they can live like Americans do. They want to live like we do. We've got to pay attention to that. We certainly have to help where we can and, and be careful about what we agree to with the rest of the world, but we have to foster that because the Chinese, the 1.3 billion Chinese citizens are the consumers for the next hundred years. We've got to get our, our government and fiscal policies right, and we have, to, um, we have to stop relying on printing money. And I've got a few minutes. I want to go quickly. This is not going to happen in the United States, so I'm not trying to scare anybody, but it's a great story, and I have a few minutes, so I want to tell it. Um, this is what that balancing rocks thing was about at the beginning. This is the, the trend of balancing rocks in, in Zimbabwe, and next to that, it, they put it on their currency. They were so proud of it. That's a Zimbabwean $1 bill. Um, the Mugabe government uh, took over when uh, Rhodesia uh, was freed from the British Empire and became Zimbabwe uh, in 1980. They replaced their dollar with a Zimbabwean dollar. And the exchange rate was actually, you, you had to pay a dollar forty-seven U.S. to buy one Zimbabwean dollar. The economy grew pretty well, but Mugabe made a number of missteps. Um, and double-digit inflation through the 80s and the 90s led to the deterioration of the dollar to the point where, in 1997, 17 years later, inflation had run at about 10% a year. And now one U.S. dollar bought 10 Zimbabwean dollars. Not terrible, but not great fiscal policy. Uh, or economic policy. So, uh, Mugabe basically stole people's farms. He took land away from citizens, Zimbabweans, um, which caused a dramatic decline in exports and food shortages in the country. Inflation spiked to 55% in 2000, and now one Zimbabwean dollar, or one US dollar, bought 100 Zimbabwean dollars. Um, they began printing money, or they didn't have computers then, so they couldn't create electrons. They printed money. Um, they were printing money to pay the army to, f to fight in the civil war that was going on in the Congo. Was a, Mugabe made an a unfortunate decision to involve his country in the civil war. He was paying his army with printed money. Inflation went to 600%, and a US dollar now bought 2,000 Zimbabwean dollars. In August 2006, in response to the runaway inflation, the government said, as of tomorrow, just take off the last three zeros on every bill out there. That's how we're going to revalue the currency. Inflation was running at about 1,300%, and the new currency traded at, it had been 1 to 2,000. It now was at 1 to 650. But remember, three zeros are missing. So it was really 650,000. In 2007, Mugabe said, well, then we'll just make inflation illegal. You went to jail. Remember what I said about the short sellers in China? If you, rose, if you increased your prices, you went to jail. Raising prices was illegal. Um, they were paying off their international debts. Um, and the only payments the government was making was international interest payments to lenders and to the military that was protecting Mr. Mugabe and his family. Um, what happened? This is why we don't print anymore. We create electrons. In 2008, the German supplier of paper that they were printing the money on refused to ship them paper because he was paying them with his currency, and it literally was not worth what it cost. Um, the printing presses broke down, and the suppliers of parts to the printing presses would no longer supply them with P parts to run the presses because the money that they were receiving in payment was worthless. Um, Inflation was running at about, I don't know how they estimate this so precisely, so I'll say roughly 231 million percent. One US dollar bought 758 billion Zimbabwe dollars, and the government said, okay, we're going to revalue, now take the last 10 zeros off the currency. In 2008, you can imagine what was about to happen. In 2008, prices doubled every day. And the government introduced a brand new $100 trillion note. There it is in the middle. In January of 2009, um, basically the economy was frozen. Zimbabwe legalized the use of other currencies for the payment of, of bills. And the second, the moment they did that, 
Um, even though they said we're going to revalue our currency now, we just took 10 zeros off, having taken three off before, now take 12. But they said you can use other currencies, so what happened? It became a US dollar economy in a nanosecond. Everyone used, at the time, the euro or the US dollar to pay their bills, and now the US dollar and the euro are the official currency of Zimbabwe. Um, and the, the Zimbabwean currency no longer exists. However, you can buy a 10 trillion Zimbabwean dollar for about a dollar, actually a dollar 19, on eBay today. This is not the story of what's going to happen to the US economy because we have the great luxury and the unique luxury of being able to print money because we are the, the world's standard but we can't neglect it. We have to be very careful. I think most people who are involved know that, but there was very little choice in 2008 and 2009. But for the long-term health of the economy and for the US people, we have to wean ourselves from this by being a little bit smarter about how we run our country, how, how we manage our businesses, how we tax them. And again, I come back to a lot of the people in this room. Um, we have to instill the confidence in people starting small businesses, going to work for small businesses, and paying taxes as a result of those businesses that it's the right thing to do. So with that, I, uh, I actually do have, I'll pass these around. We, they, they told me to bring props, so I've got, these aren't 100 trillion, these are 10 trillion Zimbabwean dollars. Um, I don't want to see them on eBay though. Um, if you have any questions, uh, I don't know how much time we have, but um, be happy to answer, try and answer any questions. Gold is an unusual commodity that has defied that secular decline chart because you can't really make it, um, you can't produce it. So as I just said with Bitcoin, gold became a good standard for a currency, an anchor for, for trade because um, it was shiny and pretty and people liked it. And no matter what you did, you couldn't increase the supply of it by more than two or 3% a year. So if we were on the gold standard, we never would have been able to do what we've done because you can't just make gold. Um, so in the past, when people get nuts and start printing $100 trillion bills, people flee to gold because it tends to retain its value around the world. You can take a gold coin and you can spend it in Zimbabwe, you can send, spend it in New York, you can spend it in Paris, you can spend it in anywhere. Um, and it has a global price, although it's measured in dollars. So it's dollar bait, it's still affected by the value of the dollar. So a lot of people historically think it's a good inflation hedge, it's a good place to go when things are bad, um, when you, but, but it doesn't pay you any interest, you don't earn a dividend, um, so it's kind of how the price is defined or determined is a little bit nebulous. It's pretty much just human supply and demand. There's a lot of folks, not a lot, there are folks I know who think the U.S. should go back to a gold standard and base our currency on it. Um, we can't. We, we've printed, we have too much money out there. Yes, ma'am. Um, they, they are, they are, no, they are correct. Gold is up about 10%. Uh, year to date. Um, historically, in difficult times, the gold price of gold has gone up, not gone down. And so you look at the uh, US equity stock markets were down 10 or 11% um, in, the, uh, in the first five, six weeks of the year. But there's a lot going on in the world with China, with, with Europe, with, with the UK. The UK voting on whether to leave the European Union is a, is a big deal. Um, when things like the Zika virus get people's attention or uh, bird flu in past years, gold tends to do well. So I would, I would tell you that gold is a good barometer of uh, world fear. It's not a great answer, but I, I've never, I've always struggled with how do you, how, how do you make the case to own gold and it's, it's difficult to do. It's how do you, how do you weaken a currency? Um, you print lots of it. Well, <laughs> we've done that. Um, we've, we've, we've increased the supply dramatically, and the dollar's still strong. So from a technical standpoint, I think it would be very difficult to orchestrate a weakening of the dollar. Um, yes, our exports are expensive. We export, what we export is know-how. We export um, 
intellectual property. So all of those, you know, I had a friend who used to say, do you, do you really want to be the guy who's making the DVDs that Windows Explorer or Windows 10, whatever, those are all made outside the US. They, they put the program on the, on the disk, they put it in a box, they ship it back here. So Microsoft doesn't do that anymore in the US. But the guys who developed Windows 10 are here, they're in California. And they're making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and they're really, anyone can make the DVD, but nobody can develop the next operating system, or we do. And so we're exporting the intellectual value. They're making the product there. The product sells in the US for $100. What they did cost five, but the other 95 goes to the guys in California. So we do have a trade deficit, but we're not, we're exporting a lot of commodity business. Now, that's also, that's an antiquated story because China, Japan, Vietnam, Indonesia, they're now with our help, unfortunately, because we train a lot of their people as engineers and then force them to go back to their countries. But um, they're moving up that food chain. And you see, you know, China's no longer the low-cost producer of things like that. You can go to Indonesia or Vietnam or Bangladesh for apparel. Um, so that's, that's really where our edge is. And we can't go back. I mean, we, we are, we're too rich a country to go back to making paper boxes. We just can't do it. Certainly, thank you. Thank you.